Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the new semester and the first talk of the Energy Institute's Energy S Symposium Speaker Series. Uh, today we're going to have a really good thought-provoking talk that cuts across disciplines, but I'll first state that there is no talk next week. Um, uh, there is no talk because of UT Energy Week activity is going on, so we're not having a talk. The next talk will be f February 8th. That will be David Colchin, who is the former counsel of Saudi Aramco. If you want to know the role of Saudi Aramco in the state of Saudi Arabia, and here's some insights into somebody who was there working for almost over a decade, uh, then that is a good talk to come to, and he's going to tell us about some insights uh, behind Saudi Aramco and its role within the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So. Uh, no small discussion, given that they're uh, looking at uh, creating an IPO on portion of Saudi Aramco, uh, which I guess they hope will be the value them as the largest oil company in the world, sort of more officially. Uh, today we have John Shramsky. Uh, John I met a couple years ago at a conference uh, where people were trying to think across disciplines of engineering, economics, ecology, uh, sociology, and so I thought it'd be great to bring him here to talk about some of the work he is doing. He has a degree in mechanical engineering, master's and bachelor's, but he has a PhD in ecology. So he was working as an engineer and said, you know what, I want to learn something else, and then uh, got an ecology PhD while still working as a practicing engineer, and now he's at the uh, uh, University of Georgia as a professor there. So his talk, I think, is going to uh, tell us a lot about how he thinks, how we can think about things across disciplines, as he's got food. Uh, security, thermodynamics, ecology, economics, all in the title. So there are several concepts there in the title. And uh, so please help me welcome uh, John Shramsky. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kerry, for the invitation. Thank you to the Energy Institute. I really appreciate being here. This is an awesome room. I appreciate the audience. So I'm Glad to be here, and I've been looking forward to this. Let me go ahead and get started, because time's going to be of the essence. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, my background is mechanical engineering. I'm an industry uh, mechanical engineer that I went back to school part-time and got my doctorate in ecology, and I've been practicing. I'm a th if, there's an, a, if there's a relationship between mechanical engineering and ecology, for me, it's that mechanical engineering is, as we all know, the transfer of energy. It's the design of apparatus to work towards you know, switching from chemical engineering to r rotational engineering uh, energy or uh, rotational energy to translational energy, et cetera. So when I started studying the ecosystem, all I see in the ecosystem is transfers of energy, and that's been a, sort of a nice cross-disciplinary area to practice. However, if you would have asked me three or four years ago, do you have anything to do with food or agriculture, I would have said no. <laughs> Um, I never foresaw this coming along. I've, I'm now working on it, what I'm about to present to you. Uh, I've got some funding through the USDA for some of this work, and I've got some students working on it now. And it's just the way tier one research works in that the questions that are asked in our laboratory and the students that come in and their background and where this all initiated. Nevertheless, it's all culminated with what I'm about to show you here. And again, I wouldn't have thought that I'd have been doing this three years ago. So all of these words matter, and uh, I'm going to... I've got like 13 or 14 slides, but they can, I can spend quite a lot of time on each one of them. It's going to take me about seven or eight of these slides to lay the groundwork to get you ready for what I'm going to show you with regard to food security. And then once I get beyond there, I'll let you know. At that point, it's sort of like a, what I would call a post-mortem, where I've got other charts to sort of start thinking about the results that we're all looking at together. And as things would go, it's worth mentioning that this work, we finally got it written, and I'm smiling when I say this, we submitted it to Nature, but, and it's, it's wonderful that I can take credit for Nature when I haven't been published in Nature, because I'm not anywhere close, but uh, we submitted it uh, over two weeks ago, and we haven't heard back yet, so uh, I don't, I honestly, my best guess is that this isn't quite Nature material. I suspect that we'll get our email soon enough, any minute now. Um, on the other hand, for those of you that have been through that, if you know, generally you get an email within two days. That's the nice thing about submitting to those journals. They let you know pretty quick. We haven't heard, so it's currently it's under consideration, so fingers crossed. Nevertheless, you know, it's, it's just it's the work we do. So uh, food security. Food security is tied up in thermodynamics, ecology, and economics, as you're about to see. This, this picture has meaning as we get started. You can see the contrast between the two. When we talk about economics, we talk about human development, uh, the urbanization 
of our species. We're trending urban globally. We're 54% urban, and we're, we're moving towards an urban lifestyle at 1% per year, and that's actually a number that keeps getting bigger, right? And this is a balanced system. This is driven by net primary production, solar energy in, net primary production, biomass development, and the complex food web. Cityscapes as we know them, they are, for all intents and purposes, natural resource and energy sinks. All materials and energy flow in this hardscape that we're looking at comes in through humans, right? We're the prime movers. If humans abandon this site, that site would essentially come to a standstill. There's nothing ecological about a cityscape like that. So you'll have a better understanding of that here in a second. To make sure we're all starting from the same foundation of what we're looking at, you know, the, the planet, natural resources, everything's finite, right? So let's kind of put that in perspective, make sure we're all looking at the same thing. We have solar energy in, short wave electromagnetic radiation in, longer wave electromagnetic radiation out. In the meantime, we have net primary production. Net primary production uses all these other sources of energy, hydro, wind, animal, geothermal, ocean waves, gravitational, etc., to help circulate the planet as we see the swirling effects just by looking at it, right? And then net primary production does its thing. We generate biomass. And then if we're not in the picture, right, and we give it sufficient time, we also, that biomass then generates fossil fuels. This is the extent of the system that we're working with. And this matters as I get into talking about a little bit more, what I'm going to show you here. On the other hand, we're all presumably uh, a lot of the folks in the room have you know, had time to contemplate what this figure is. Don't worry too much about the units, but this is our energy, our power curve, and we're at about 17 or 18 terawatts at the moment, continuous, right? The blue line is the population of the planet. I think we're up at about 7.5 billion right now. And then the green line is the division, uh, is the per capita energy consumption. So if you if we multiply the population by the per capita, we get our total energy consumption. I put these both up here to start showing the contrast. Over here, we've got the balanced system that we're aware of. Over here, this is our human system, and this is the energy that we're expending. The, 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 the ramifications of that, and there's lots of ramifications, right? These are the things that we're contending with and working with all the time. It's, you know, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, polar ice caps melting, uh, you know, acidity of the oceans rising and whatnot. There's these things that we hear about quite often. Uh, one of the uh, more nerve-wracking things for me in my research is, is the loss of phytomass on the planet, to the extent that everybody's aware of this, but we, as a species, when we build out, when we build cities or we clear forests for development or for the materials or whatnot, over time, the vital mass of the planet continues both directly and indirectly to disappear. We're down around 50% over the last 3,000 years. We're down 11% in the last 100 years or so. And this is a number that the, the carbon balance folks keep a really close eye on. And what, what this means, though, is from the energetics standpoint, the thermodynamics of the natural system, okay, <clears throat> that's less biomass for the complex food web. And we don't really know to what effect that has, right? I mean, the biosphere appears to be working currently, all right, but if you would have come to me as an engineer and as a scientist 100 years ago and said, geez, we're going to take the phytomass mass of the planet down 10% or 30% or 40%, I would have said, I don't know what it's going to do, but I would advise you not to do that because you're losing. When we say phytomass, mass, the difference between phytomass mass and biomass, phytomass mass is primarily the plant kingdom, and, and, and most of that, 85% of that is in forests, right? So biomass, phytomass, somewhat synonymous, but we're talking about phytomass here and basically the primary producers. They take solar energy in, create chemical energy, and then that's available for the rest of the food web. If you reduce that by 50%, that has ramifications. So humans... We're here and we're doing our thing and we're, that's still climbing, right? And then the planet is losing its, its, its underlying engine. It's the, it's the energy that's running the planet in, in an important way. All right, that being said, this is where we're going to transition to talking about food security. Um, despite that, and if you need sort of a mind's eye of what we're talking about, we talk about phytomass destruction, but it's, you know, when we move in and we clear cut forests or we have urban areas 
and you know, just the expansion of the human species, which is happening fairly rapidly. All right, despite all that that's going on, food production is still increasing, which, uh, and there's reasons why this is happening. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, we're, I'm going to talk about dietary energy produced. You're going to see this acronym, DEP. And DEP ultimately is the total calories grown or captured. DEP is different than DES. Dietary energy supplied is the amount of energy, uh, cal caloric energy that's available to you in the open market system here in the U.S. or around the world. Your country might not grow food, but it has plenty of food available because it's able to trade for it. But when we're talking about dietary energy produced, this is, these are the calories grown specifically by a farmer or by a country or by the, the planet. All right? So we're going to focus on that. So despite this that's going on and all the ramifications that we have with it, the planet is losing phytomass, but we humans, we have plenty and we're expanding. So there's a lot on these charts. I'm going to come back to these, but for now, I just want you to focus at the top of the line here and then the green line over here. All right. This chart over here is the total dietary energy produced gross energy through global agriculture, all right? So approximately, if you know your units, but uh, 0.028 zeta joules, it's about 1% roughly of net primary production of the planet. It's a big number. And when you talk to the ag people and the folks that are in this business, sure enough, we are growing our food supply and we're doing well. And this is because of agricultural intensification that we're aware of, mechanization, pesticides, irrigation, uh, um, and then the, after, the, the, the things that we can bring to bear afterwards to distribute that food with transportation, preservation, preparation, marketing, and you know, all these things that we put all this energy into so that we can grow our, you know, our total calories produced. If we take the total, and then if we look at it on a per capita basis, so if we take the population and we divide that into the number, it's still a rising number over here. It's just, it's just the slope of the rise isn't quite as much because you're dividing through by the population. So this is per capita DEP, calories grown by the world, and this is total. All right, so we're going to come back and look at the rest of this here as I build up some of this. All right, so thermodynamically, what I'm about to show you, this is very misleading. When you look at a total number like that, that's like, looking, that's like looking at the stock market and saying the stock market's rising, everything's good. And I think everybody in here would agree, and, and anybody who works in the business community, that's absolutely, you know, you can't get away with that. You've got to look at the, end, you know, the, 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 the companies that are driving that metric and make sure it's not just one or two country, companies that are driving it, or it, you know, what's the underlying health of the economy that's driving that stock market, and where do you think it's going to go? The same is true for these numbers right here. All right, so we're going to start with some primary assumptions. All of them are related back to thermodynamics. So on one hand, they're assumptions. On the other hand, we know they're true. And we're going to lay these out. And then we're going to look at some empirical data and see if it sort of follows what we expect. The first thing is, is that rather than looking at the global dietary energy produced, let's just look at it on a country basis. All right, and we can respect the fact that countries are independent, complex, adaptive, self-organizing uh, entities that respond to their nationalistic intents, their politics, their farm policies, their natural resources. Some countries are blessed with wonderful natural resources. Others don't have those, so they have to, again, take on the open market to get what they need. But nevertheless, countries move primarily on their own based on their governments and their own self-interest, right? Uh, here's an, to the extent some of you have heard this before and others probably haven't, I need to spend some time on it, but cities are thermodynamic sinks. This goes back to that first picture I was showing you on the intro when you compared it, you know, the natural system to the urban hardscape that was right next to it, right? There, the idea is, is that cities can't survive unless somebody delivers their materials and their energy to the board, to their borders, to their boundaries, right? It's, you could draw, it's, like, it's, it's a perfect system from a thermodynamic analysis standpoint in that you can draw a control surface around it, you've got your control volume, and all energy that comes in 
you know, is processed, but the cities, in, in cities in general around the planet, I mean, there's some minor exceptions, but in general, they don't generate anything on their own. They're just, they're sinks for materials and energy, and then they're also generating all the waste that go with that, all right? But the point that we're taking away from that is, is that we're going to surmise on the front end that urbanization matters. So when I look at a country, and we know, we know from previous studies that are out there, and one of them, by the way, I just want to mention is from uh, uh, Robbie Berger, who is going to be a, um, a postdoc here, here in the Energy Institute starting. When does he start? Okay. So, anyway, he's coming. But uh, he's done a lot of work with uh, the amount of energy consumption with cities in general. But ur if, if you're a country and you're 10% urban or you're a similar country and you're 90% urban, we know for a fact if you're 90% urban, you're going to be burning and using more energy and more resources than the country that's 10% urban. All right, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, particularly from a lot of you know, comments that I've heard myself and some of the thoughts I had when I first started getting into this area of research, but in that you, know, you think of, well, if I have 100 people and they're living out and they're just spread out in the countryside, it seems like it would be a whole lot more efficient to have them living in course, close quarters to take care of their schooling and their med you know, the medical care and whatnot. And that's true. You do get some efficiencies of scale with people living closer together. The trouble with cities are that not only do you get those efficiencies of scale, but then uh, individuals that live in an urban lifestyle tend to do more. Instead of going to, you know, I'm making it up as I go, but it's, instead of going to something in the country, which may be sort of a low energy event, you're going to go to multiple rock concerts or symphony orchestras, or you're going to have better medical care because there's sort of a synergistic effect that goes on. But, you know, without trying to articulate all of it, the data clearly shows that, you know, uh, urban lifestyles garner higher per capita energy consumptions than uh, countryside or, or rural lifestyle, uh, lifestyles. So cities are thermodynamic sinks. As a country, how urban you are matters. Uh, it's been likened in the literature to being a low, cities, um, in an economic sense, you hear cities are the engine of innovation or the, you know, the business engine uh, to drive the economy. That's true. But they're a locomotive. And from a ther thermodynamic sense, they're also a locomotive in that they just take in energy, they burn it, and then they, you don't necessarily, from a thermodynamic standpoint, get anything in return. All right, and there's a coal car in the back, which is being served by the so-called countryside or hinterlands right now. So cities are thermodynamic sinks, and that matters. Increasing population density degrades the environment. That goes without saying, but we're going to make this point as we look at some of the empirical data. If you have a given space, and then you add more and more cattle or more and more humans over time, that space, if it's not suitable to, uh, um, to the sustainability of that population load that you have over time, that environment's going to degrade. And then the last is that gross domestic product is a direct measure of natural resource consumption. The, 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 the more expansive and the more uh, through flow that's generated through your economy, the more natural resources that are needed to feed that economy, and that is shown. So, you know, these are primary assumptions, all of them around thermodynamic facts. That being said, with these, let's start trying to find a way to express them. And this is hard, so these next two slides kind of hang with me, and then I promise you'll be rewarded. So, all right. So we got to begin by, how do we have this here? Capturing the thermodynamic plotting. By kind of, okay. So what you're looking at here, and I apologize, these red dots are kind of hard to see, but it's not necessarily that you see each one of them. But we have taken, uh, and our data set varies from about 160 to 170 countries, depending on which particular chart we're using. And it, and, but it goes over 40, generally goes over 45 years, 1965 to 19, uh, or to 2010. Okay, this is 1965, and then I'm about to show you a 2005 or 2010. Uh, but what we've done is we treat every country as its own agent, and it's only being listed in the order based on its percent, its percent urbanization. All right, so if, you know, you could, you conceivably, and we do, you could have Bermuda and China side by side. And you're like, but those are two very different countries. But percent urbanization, I'm only interested in the prime movers in Bermuda and the prime movers in China are humans. And I want to know what percentage of your country is urban, because that gives me an indication as to 
what your resource allocation is for the humans that reside within your boundaries, okay? So we line them up as percent urbanization, and, and then the, the percent urbanization is the dividing line between gray and green here, and that's this vertical axis over here. This vertical axis over here is the, is the DEP that I mentioned before, dietary energy production. All right, and that's the red dots. And the black line is 2,000 kilocalories per day, which is the agreed upon desirable food supply for a, a reasonable, healthy population, all right? So the red dots are the DEPs for each of these countries. So in 196, so what you would expect is, is that if you're more rural, which would be, you know, countries down near this end, right, that your DEP is going to be more self generated and it's going to be closer to your 2,000 per capita because there's not going to be incentive, especially back in 65 where global markets weren't the, the way they are today, to grow too much more because there isn't a market there to sell it. You're feeding your population. As your economy grows and perhaps you've got access to more markets, you tend to grow more to sell it. And, and you see, you know, a, a bit of spread in the data, and this is 1965. And I thought this, yeah. <clears throat> so we normally go out to 2010. I just got 2005 here uh, by mistake. But uh, the, you can see the percent urbanization shifts quite a bit, going from 1965 to 2005. And then you can see, as we would expect, that as these countries become more urban and we start getting into global markets, then their uh, production, in some cases, starts to rise quite a bit because presumably there's money to be made, right? And even seeing some of that over here. Um, we do see the standard deviation shift drastically, and I get into those numbers here in a second. All right, the main point is, is that this is the backdrop. This is how we're going to express some of this data that I'm about to show you, all right? So we're going to take it a step further, and we're back to 1965, and we're going to divide this into four quadrants. And this, the, the, the upper and the lower you already know about, this is the 2,000 kilocalories per capita per day line. And then this line is 50% urban. It's, it's a bit of a random selection, but we figured if you're ahead of this line, the majority of your population is urbanized. And if you're less than this line, the majority of your population is actually living in the countryside. Okay? So we've got quadrant one, two, three, and four, greater than 50%, greater than 2,000, greater than 2,000, less than 50%, et cetera, et cetera. All right? and we've got our countries ordered this way. And I've got a couple of exemplar countries there circled just so you can kind of see where some of these, have, it's hard to read them, Thailand, Philippines, Egypt, Haiti, United Arab Emirates, Belgium, United States, Argentina, Australia, et cetera. All right, so that's our four quadrant definition. Uh, so getting back to our assumptions, presumably then if your GDP is increasing, or if you're getting more urban, this is the engine of our economy, this is the engine of our growth, right? You're going to see countries shift left to right. And presumably, if it's a finite system and population continues to grow, you're going to see some degradation of DEP, dietary energy produced by each country, because the environment is not as conducive and your population is loading is getting high, right? So, you know, you're, we should be, from our assumptions, we should be seeing trends from left to right. If you have deterioration of the environment, like population density, overall within the countries, you should see shifting from top to bottom, right? So these are the assumptions that we laid out. This is the map that we're going to use to plot and look at how these things unfold. And if this is true, even though our total agricultural output is growing over time, on a per country basis, we should be predictably seeing DEP drop depending on how urban you are and how intensive you're using your resources and how, what your population density is and some of these other metrics that are affecting us on a country by country basis. All right. So with that, got some empirical data. So given the four thermodynamic assumptions, theoretically, oh, that's a, so, so moving left to right, moving top to bottom, ideal, not ideally, <laughs> trust me, um, the, but if our assumptions prove true and the human population is shifting urban and we're using non-renewable resources 
and the environment is taking a hit while we do this over time, right, there should be an overall shift over time into quadrant four, which in thermodynamic theory, that's a, it's sort of like thermodynamic ground, right? Every, you know, it's, if it's a non-renewable system and you continue to discharge it, you're discharging it to ground. And this is essentially ground. It's a bit arbitrary because we're just drawing this line at 50%, but it gives us a number to start quantifying. Okay. All right, so let's look at some empirical numbers. Uh, so what we're looking at here, again, is the four quadrants. All right. Percent urban is along the horizontal axis. So in 1965, this country here was 10% urban. This country here was 31% urban, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then on this axis is DEP. So it's the same graph we were just looking at. But we've color-coded it. So if you're in quadrant one, it's gray. Quadrant two, green, yellow, red, et cetera. And then we've got a bar chart over here. So in 1965, we had 18 countries in quadrant four. In quadrant one, we had 31, 45, 70 over here, right? And this is, you know, I don't know what healthy is, but this is kind of reasonable to look at. You've got some cities in the world. You've got lots of country, you know, and it seems like there's enough there to pull from, right? Um, so what we've got here, though, is we've got 45 years of data on five-year increments, and I'm going to play this for you. This is a GIF, and you can watch this. The, you're going to watch these move. Oh, and I'm sorry, and then the... The size of the dots, in this case, are population density. So this is how we've snuck in population density. So the bigger the dots are, the greater the population density. Now remember what I said with the assumption. If we assume that population density over time degrades the environment, you should see DEP start to drop because you're, getting less, you're, you're able to get less productivity out of your environment. Right? So as these dots grow, you should see them shift down. And, and basically, for the theory we've set forth, everything should shift to quadrant four. All right, so let's give this a watch here. Um, and then the bar chart over here on the right will continually update. So you got the date mark here and then the bar chart. So this is it. This is real data. Dietary energy produced by 106, this was 164 countries tracked for 45 years and population density with the size of the dots. There, so it repeats. All right. We could talk about this for the next two hours. And it's actually happened. So um, let me boom this out here and try to stop it. All right. Ugh. I can do this. All right. So we went from 1965 to 2010. All right. Uh, I think this started out at like 18. And now we have 58 in quadrant four. I, I don't remember where the rest started. I, I got some of those numbers here in a later part. But you could, you, know, you could see the trend that as population densities increased, their DEPs came down. Now, and, and, and then we also saw, saw a steady shift from left to right, as we saw in the previous graphs as well. You know, where we can go and talk about this is that certainly this is market effects that are going on, right? There are countries out there that are saying, yeah, 1965, we grew a lot of our own food. But in the open market system, it makes no sense for us to grow our food. We can make automobiles or so, you know, and we can trade for food, all right? So absolutely, there's some market effects. The, the, and, and that's a very valid discussion, dietary energy supply versus dietary energy produced, okay? On the other hand, thermodynamically, over you know, a 45-year data set, if we predict that population density does degrade the environment, if we predict that GDP then does use natural resources, if we, those things are all true, and we should see this happening irrespective of what the economy is doing, this is exactly what is going on. We, you know, we've got a discharging system that's underway, and DEP on a per-country basis is dropping. All right, let me take this one step further. So that, the size of the dots here are population density. And then the size of the dots here are gross domestic product. This is a smaller data set. This is the only one we do with a smaller data set, only because we couldn't get GDP back into the 60s. And in order to keep it from 1965 to 
2010, we dropped the, the size of the data set, but nevertheless, you can see the trend here. So in this case, again, the size of the dot is relative to GDP. And this is the same, uh, no, it's not quite the same bar chart because we don't have the same number of countries involved. So from a GDP standpoint, you can clearly see that urbanization and GDP, you know, have a huge correlation. That's not any, you know, big revelation. And you can see the countries that are left out here that don't have that, uh, that engine that's driving it, but yet they're still hovering over their 2000 DEP line. Yeah, so there you have it. So that essentially is the theory and the empirical numbers that sort of go along with the theory. All of the charts that I'm showing you here now is to start to look at the data a little bit deeper to start sort of figuring out what we're, you know, making sure we understand what we're looking at. So uh, if you have any questions, I mean, certainly we can have questions at the end, but if there's anything that comes up now would be fine because I've sort of laid the groundwork for that discussion if you're interested. You look like you were going to raise your hand or no? Oh, okay. All right, so let's go back and revisit some of our assumptions just so we kind of understand what we're looking at. Countries are independent self-organizing organisms, oops, <laughs> controlling resource extraction, including food calories based on laws, policies, values, economics, all right? So here's a couple sample countries over the 45-year period. Uh, countries are behaving as they would based on their national interests, and we can see that playing out here, right? Um, these are different colors, not because of the quadrants, but just so you can see the different trajectories of some of these, all right? If we look at the beginning and the end, we don't look at the total path, we just have two points. This is the four quadrant system, and if where each country ended, that's the color that we gave the vector, all right? So you can see that the overall average of all the countries is going down, and I've got this on another chart I'll show you here in a second. All right, we've got, these are the countries, this is the 164 country data set, so we're back up to the whole data set. Um, we've got the countries that were coming into quadrant four down here. We've got these countries, of course, coming into quadrant three. There is some movement, and I'll show you this again here in a minute. There is some movement over the 45 year span between quadrants two and three, but uh, of the 40 countries or so that moved into quadrant four, only one came out. So it sort of follows the idea that once you get into thermodynamic ground, it's hard to get back out. And then you can see that we have all the high performing countries that up here that are feeding the world at this point. And I have those numbers. All right, so it's true. Countries are acting on their own. They're independent. You got to look at every country. We can't really look at the planet as a whole. Yes, sir. Maybe I'm stealing your thunder. You have four more charts to go or so. Yeah. Um, can you break down what the contributors are? You had mentioned one potential one where just specialization of labor where you'd import versus degradation of the environment. I could think of a couple others. Uh, typically, what I've been taught over the years, and maybe it's changed with newer ideas and knowledge, is that a lot of times when we have poverty in foreign countries, it's because of government corruption and and um, you know, bad governance that really impedes the economic system that would naturally tend to solve things. So do you have a breakdown? Uh, I don't have a breakdown of that, no. We haven't gotten into that level of economics. Uh, the only way, the only maybe answer that I have to sort of uh, expand on that a little bit is that, you know, what we're looking at here, and particularly with these countries here, you're like, you look at them, you're like, is there any chance that if they're given the right technology or the right governance, they could start pulling themselves out? Um, this whole system, despite its flaws, is run by that first chart I showed, you know, the total power curve, right? And so, mm, 
I mean, population growth times yeah. uh, calories consumed per yeah, capita. So it, unfortunately, the system that we're looking at is being run, you know, the, 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 the global food system, it's been estimated to, to con take up about 15 to 30 percent of our total power consumption. So 15 to 30 percent of this is required to run the system that we were looking at there. So the idea that, you know, what uh, economic adjustments, what social adjustments can we make to try to, you know, to try to start changing some of these trajectories, it involves more energy investment and it involves, you know, going into these countries with social inequities and not only fixing the social inequity, but then we have to bring energy to bear to add a, and more energy on top of the curve that we're already looking at. So it's a little bit disheartening. So, so is it environmental degradation or could it be that the opportunities in the city are much greater? That's what tends to draw people to urban environments, I thought. And it's uh, that urbanization trend is sort of getting ahead of its skis where the infrastructure isn't there to really support them at a higher level of consumption? It's a uh, great question. It's, it's actually both. It's environmental degradation and it's, it's the economic system that's not rising to the occasion or it's faltering, right? And it's on a per capita basis. So all of these are loaded with a population number. If, you, if the population loading wasn't there, certainly the production could be higher. But as production goes up, the population continues to rise with it. And if the economy can't keep up with it, then it's faltering as well. So it's, it's, a, it, it's thermodynamic decay, even though it's, so there's, a th there's the environmental degradation, but then within the economic degradation, there's thermodynamic decay involved because you don't have the energy being routed into the economic system. And, and so it still qualifies as being moving towards ground because these com countries that are here, they're gonna have to invest more energy to get out of there and how much energy is there for them to invest. You know, we're already sort of running on maximum our principle right now. Does that help? All right, so countries are independent, self-organizing, uh, increasing population, density degrades the environment. You know, we see the shift downward as these uh, countries got more dense. Uh, the numbers, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but if, if you take this grouping of countries, uh, I'll have it later, which you take this grouping of countries, their population density is twice the population density of these countries above 2000. So it's a significant difference. And then if you look at the overall GDP significance uh, with our smaller data set that we had here, this grouping of country, and looking at 2010, this grouping of countries had a GDP that was four times the average of this grouping in company, uh, of countries. So cities are thermodynamic sinks, urbanization matters. We can see that p clearly playing out. Gross domestic product is a direct measure of natural resource consumption. So as these GDPs pick up, you know, there's also an environmental consequence. Um, you know, all the answers as to why it's moving in, we can surmise thermodynamically that it should be going into four. There's, you know, three or four reasons. There's probably good 10 reasons or so why they should be going down there, and they are. So when we look at the quadrant shifting, you, these numbers are kind of small, but these, this is the total number of countries that shifted between the four quadrants, all right? And what you see is, is that when you shift into quadrant one, 18 went that way, one went this way, of 14 that went from two to four, none went back, of 11 that went from one to four, one went back, et cetera, et cetera. So if you work that all out, there's the most movement between quadrants was between two and three. Once you start getting into four, it's pretty unidirectional. If we just take the net movements, then you can see the numbers are either moving to quadrant one or quadrant four and three. So you're either shifting down or you're shifting to the right, which thermodynamically is what we would predispose. Dispose. So um, if we take the overall average from 1965 to 2010, um, the countries in general, DEPs, are shifting down. It works out to be about three countries every four years drops below 2,000 calories per capita. All right, so now we're back at looking at this chart. If you recall, when we first started, I said this is the global 
per capita energy consumption. That's the green line. Agriculture is good. It's working on a global basis. This blue line is the standard deviation among all the countries of the world. So as I mentioned, when we were looking at some of those scatter charts, if you looked over time, the overall DEP production was spreading out. They were you know, getting further away from 2,000 calories per capita. There was you know, a small number of countries producing a lot, and then there were a lot of companies, uh, countries that were producing a little. So the overall standard deviation between them. And then this is the actual per country average. So we treat China, Bermuda, Nicaragua, the United States, Australia, they're all just one data point. And if you take their per capita and you average them all up, overall, we're declining. And that's the same as this value that you see going on right here. All right, so there's a, you know, there, basically there's a huge difference when you start treating countries as their own independent organisms. Overall, from 1965 to 2010, uh, 1965, we had 101 countries that were feeding, capable of feeding themselves, 63 that weren't. In 2010, we have only 66 countries that remain that are making, that are producing, growing more per capita calories than, uh, more than 2,000 per capita calories, and, and then 98 that have now come down into quadrants three and four. Uh, and you can see the disparity with the overall standard deviation in that you know, we've got these 66 countries or these countries here, right? And so you've got a good chunk of, I don't know how many are here in quadrant one, um, something less than 66, right? But you've got 98 down here. So they're not way below 2,000, all right? So you can see it's like we have a lot of countries not producing producing a little less, and then we have a few countries that the global market is, is, uh, is working to get them, to, to, to push them to produce a lot more because presumably there's, there's money to be made and there's, you know, or, or things to be traded for, all right? And so, all right, I, this might be my last chart here, the, but it might be the longest. All right, so looking at the numbers as they play. Quadrants three and four, yellow and red, 98 countries. Back in 1965, we had 63 countries, all right? And if you recall, quadrant four, the, we started with like 18, and then we were up to 48 or 58, right? This is the chart we looked at at the beginning of the talk, and this top line is the total dietary energy produced by global agriculture. And this is uh, grown or captured, so this includes marine calories as well, all right? Uh, the 98 countries that comprise quadrants three and four are only producing, you can't see the number here, but it's about 3.003 zeta joules. It works out to be roughly 10% of the global DEP, all right? The remaining 66 countries these are the urban ones. These are the less than 50% urban ones, right? They're producing the uh, remaining 90% of that DEP, all right? And then these are the two numbers that are changing. As countries seemingly, when they come out of quadrants one and two and they drop into quadrants three or four, for whatever reason, they stop producing. Market conditions, environmental conditions, or whatnot. And uh, that's unnerving because uh, I think that's what I show down here because essentially what you've got here is these countries here and here are supercharging their agriculture to take care of what's going on here. Population numbers, this is about a quarter, quadrants three and four work out to be a little over a quarter of the world's population. So a quarter of the world's population right now is producing this much agriculture and of course depending on the rest of the world to make enough for themselves as well as make enough for them. Yes, sir? Um, yeah, so I don't know if you stated, but are there any key characteristics between the countries in quadrant one and quadrant four, like just from like a qualitative standpoint? I haven't looked at them yet. Um, I, I haven't looked at them yet. And, I, and I'm, this is, there's a humorous side to this in that the coupled 
Natural and Human Systems NSF grant, and maybe some people in the room know. Um, it was supposed to be due on Tuesday because of the government shutdown. It's due tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, we're putting it together, and that's basically what we're getting at, is we're taking what we've outlined here, and we're asking for funding to start looking at each of these countries on a case-by-case -case basis to start looking at exactly what you're asking about. And I'll, I'll, so I don't have an answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I got to chuckle because anybody who submitted a grant, and then the idea, it was the idea that was postponed, and we're going to live through it. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor, in one of your points before, you indicated that there's a correlation between the GDP and the movement of the quadrants. But my question is, you, you also mentioned at one point that some countries moved into more like industrial uh, applications and said we can import the food. Uh, do I, the I was saying that in a general way, just sort of like surmising how market conditions work. But oh, I mean, yeah. would there be in any chance one of the countries that is, that is in quadrant four that is uh, that has a very high GDP, but uh, doesn't produce its own food at, at this level and just uh, imports it? Um, sure. Uh, maybe this is getting at what you're asking, but there, in the 45-year study period, there's one country that came out of Quadrant 4, and it was Germany. And we've listed that in our NSF grant as an exemplar country that we want to study. Now, we all, we've done some preliminary research. Germany is very well known for its intensive agriculture. I mean, they're, they're, they're very good at it. Does that mean the rest of the world can do that? Or does that mean how much energy they are? You know, if, if we say that 15 to 30 percent of global energy consumption goes to the food, total food system, how does that compare to Germany? Is Germany putting in 50 percent? Or are they doing 15 to 30 percent like everybody else, but yet they were able to climb out of quadrant four? You know, those are the questions we need um, to I, I exactly thought of Germany at th that point. I, I was just looking at the points, if you could show them before, the ones you said, the hypotheses or the inferences. Not okay. the results, the ones before that you said, uh, w the, you know, the conjectures you had. One of them had something to do with the GDP. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm driving you crazy with this. Yep. Okay. Um, basically, what we're saying there is, is that if GDP is increasing, and we know that it's a linear extraction, right? As the economy grows, as GDP grows, you take natural resources, you modify them, you use them, and when we're done, we store them in our house, we store them in a storage shed, or they go in a landfill, or they go in the ocean, or they go in the atmosphere, right? I mean, that's, that's the extent of it. So, it, you know, we basically said, you know, if, it, it, let's take this, let's put an economic spin on this and, and say, well, if, if this is true, we should be able to plot GDP and, and, and show that GDP has an effect, and it is, in fact, driving this thing and driving DEP down. And so that's what you're seeing there with our attempt at those dots in that particular chart. Does that help? Uh, we're not, we haven't done any correlations with it yet. And, and Professor, just one more question. In cases of countries like the Netherlands right now that are uh, heavily focusing on vertical farming, and uh, does this in any way offset the results in a way that uh, uh, the measure of urbanization versus the, the DEP, like the one we, we've been talking about, because vertical farming can be done in, in urban areas. So this, this does sh give a bit of a, um, you know, a, a, a strange case, maybe, if this is implemented on a much larger uh, factor scale. The way we've handled that, and, and we actually address this with a paragraph in our paper, is, you know, urban, thermodynamically, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, urban agriculture will never be sufficient to be a player in feeding a metropolitan area, an urban area. And we say that from a standpoint of that if you take, if you do the numbers, and we do this in our paper, uh, if you know, we use Singapore, if you take the, the area of Singapore and you assume that you could farm the whole area. And let's say we're gonna plant Green Revolution rice. And if you, you, know, and, and you have a wonderful harvest, as if there were no buildings, uh, at most you can feed 11% of the Singapore population. And, and well, you can't grow on 100% of Singapore's land, so it's an unreasonable estimate. 
but nevertheless, it gives you an idea. Then if you take it a step further and you say, well, what about vertical farming? What about farming on rooftops? And what if, you know, we can't get 11%, but we can start. Um, the conjecture there is, is that sure, but it's just gonna take a whole lot more energy to do that because you still gotta bring all of those resources in to the city and, and you know, so there's water resources, energy resources, energy to move the water. Um, we don't see it as viable. And, and we do the numbers to show it. I mean, it's, it sounds like we're sort of giving up on that before we even start, but it's just thermodynamically, you can't get the numbers to work. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So do you think of the future as countries kind of uh, go from two to three, more to one and four? Do you think they'll start seeing this trend and start, there'll be more countries entering one where they see that there's a lot of, you know, just a few players in the, you know, that are providing the world's food. Do you think more and more countries will say, hey, that's a good economic opportunity to excel, and so they might start trying to move into the one themselves? Or do you think they'll just end up going to four just because of their dynamics? Uh, in other words, do you think folks will approach this from a marketing standpoint, say there's, there's opportunities here? Yeah, basically, like, if I was a country in, let's say, two, and I see that I'm falling into the three region, would they say, hey, let's divert some of our funds from, you know, something else, put this into agricultural infrastructure and try to move to the one or maybe the higher two area, and that way try to kind of, you know, capitalize on this trend that's going on? I think so, sure. We didn't take that stand when we summarized it. We, we looked at it more from a food security, national security standpoint, rather than looking at it as a market opportunity, we simply said, geez, you know, if you use our method to sort of map out your circumstances, right, and you recognize that this is not a good situation, then, you know, if you're here and you've got, uh, you know, uh, limited natural resources, uh, whether, you know, depending on the size of your country and whatnot, and, and you're highly urban, your options are limited, and you need to start thinking about that and with regional alliances and whatnot. If you're here, if you're here, or if you're in one or two, then you've got more options for your national security or your food security to work with other countries. And, and so we, we kind of, you know, we, we put words to that effect, like look at your your urbanization, your GDP, your natural resources, think about where you are, where your DEP is coming from, where your food is coming from, whether it's coming domestically or it's coming internationally, and make those decisions. But you're right in that countries are independent, right? So there might be countries with benefit, you know, with, uh, um, with leaders that are thinking of their country's best interests, and, and they take it, take it from a food security standpoint, and there could be others that are thinking, well, we've got an opportunity that we need to take advantage of in a very short order. Let's do it and make some money. Yeah. Yes. Have you averaged the population of the nations in quadrant four and the nations in quadrant one? I'm thinking you might get a lot of Caribbean and Pacific islands sort of cluttering up uh, quadrant four that really overall in the world's thermodynamics don't really matter much. Um, the thermodynamics matter to all countries, small, island, or otherwise. And yeah, we've looked at them, and, and to the extent that you see countries coming into quadrants three and quadrant four, the small countries with limited natural resources are typically the ones that go in first. But there are some medium and large countries that have moved in there as well. So. That's kind of the, the interesting point is that we treat, that's kind of scary about this is, you know, Bermuda and China are very different with regard to natural resources. All, but all this says is that Bermuda is going to move into quadrant three or four quicker than China. But China, or China isn't such a good example, but like Australia, the United States, or Canada, if you're in quadrant one and your economy's booming, you're... Yeah, you're, all this means is that, yes, you're producing more per capita, but you've also got this going on. So, yeah, you're making money, but not only do you have to feed your own, uh, uh, your, your own population, but we've got this growing population here that isn't capable of completely feeding themselves. So it's like a double-edged sword. 
you're thinking about taking care of your own, your own domestic cultivation, but we've got a, you know, a quarter of the world's population and growing that also is there. And, and we, you know, so you've got the countries that are not producing, uh, they've got concerns, but then you've got cityscapes and the urban areas of those countries and the urban areas of all the other countries of the world that are also uh, would be of concern because if you don't have food delivered to your boundaries, I mean, that's a, it's basically a cement desert. So, I mean, you know, you've got cities of the world that would have food security issues as this progresses, and then you've also got the countries of the world that are down below. Here. Um, on the figure on slide number 13, the one at the end, yep. have you uh, tried to, uh, the one like upper to the left, like uh, disaggregate that, but how many calories are like uh, consumed by humans th but that come from plants versus, for example, uh, from the ones that come from like animals? Because thermodynamically... From plants and animals, you said? Yeah. No, we, we haven't looked at that. Because thermodynamically, I mean, if... Uh, there's more meat consumption, for example, then that requires more steps, right? Because animals require food, which then it consumes more resources. So, so two quick comments on that. Uh, if we, if the whole world shifted away from a meat diet and went straight to a plant diet tomorrow, all of these numbers would shift up appreciably and would take that into account. The dietary energy produced per capita dietary energy that we used for each of these countries came from a, uh, another study that uh, we've been working with, and they account for meat and processed food. And so what it means is that if you grow grains and then you ship them to the meat industry, you don't get credit for those grains. You only get credit for the meat calories that came out. So you could grow 500 calories per capita in grain, but if you turn around and give it to the meat industry, and out of the meat industry, you only get 100 calories per capita, you only get credit for those 100 calories per capita. So if you, we did away with all the meat, uh, production and then all that plant production that was going into the meat or the processed food industry went into this, you'd see all these numbers shift up. Um, we know that much and we've looked, and I don't have it here, but we've looked at some of the, uh, the, the effects of a meat diet and that's in our grant, but we just haven't got into those numbers completely. Yeah, it's huge though, that's huge. This is a great example where if we could get, if and when we get those numbers, we could show this and then we could show it without meat and, we, and everybody would be able to see the shift up and everybody would get it. You know, we hear that meat is an energy intensive, non-sustainable food, but this would be a wonderful way to show it. Yep. Potential to be in quadrant one if they wanted to grow? The I'm sure there's some that are there. You know, again, we got to get back and do a case by case study. Some of them are, you know, small urban and have always been that way. But. And then also for the small uh, urban countries, if like, do you look at, at their, uh, their thermodynamic sink, like how much energy they're actually taking up versus other countries? Because if there's a lot of small countries in Quadrant 4, they might not be taking that much energy compared to big countries like the United States in Quadrant 1. Um, true, and that just speaks to the independence of each of the countries and their trajectories. And, you know, the thermodynamics are such that if the economy continues to run, you're going to continue to use natural resources. If you continue to have your population grow, you're going to continue to hurt the environment. And, you know, and overall, irregardless of each country's circumstances, over time, they're eventually going to work their way down. That's kind of what we're showing here. When it comes to the country by country stuff, we just haven't gotten into it yet because we haven't had funding for it. And, I mean, we'll get, you know, we'll get some work done on it without funding because it's interesting. We'll keep putzing along with it. But if we were to get one or two of these grants, then the sky's the limit. We'd really be able to break this open and, you know, get some case studies going. John, can you go to slide nine? Would you have the country level, uh, at least a few country examples? And I guess specifically point out, maybe kind of hard to see from the colors, but point out with your hand or something, the China. I mean, you have China, Brazil, U.S., three large countries that so have lots of land. The U.S. is right here. This yeah. is the brown one. Uh, Brazil is the blue one right here. Uh, Argentina is the magenta, I guess, which is right here. And Jordan, that looks to be brown too. That's Jordan. And Paraguay, which is the green. This is Paraguay. It's interesting, the numbers, that you, the, the countries that we see here, if you go back and, and you look at some of the FAO reports about the future of agriculture and where our 
you know, if the population continues to grow, I think they're projecting 9 billion or 10 billion, where that food would come from. They basically look at sub-Sahara Africa and they look at South America as being natural resources that still have kind of untapped. And you see that sort of playing out in these numbers as well. In fact, I think I have, real quick, I can't do all of it. If you look at ecological reserve, which is the, you know, the difference between the biocapacity of a country and the ecological footprint, um, and it's a measure of, you, how big your footprint is versus how much biocapacity you have. And you know, we've run out of time, so I won't get into all the details. But this is some preliminary stuff that a student just did here recently, and I haven't had a chance to dig into it. But the size of the dot has to do with the amount of ecological reserve that you have, whether it's a positive or a negative. And red is negative, and green is positive. So if you know, basically what this does is it takes that four quadrants in 2010 and we look at it from an ecological reserve standpoint. Ideally, if you have a green dot, you're still good. You're still ahead of yourself. You're, you're, you know, your footprint isn't bigger than your resources. If you have a red dot, you're already in the negative. So you can kind of see where Argentina, Australia, Paraguay, Brazil, the U.S., and this has a lot to do with our carbon footprint, China. You know, so even though the U.S. is a huge food producer, when it comes to their effect on the global environment, obviously it's big, but you can start to get some idea that, hey, if we need food from somewhere, or if you want countries, if you want to target countries that have a chance of getting out, you know, Congo, that's where I said the Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Colombia, Peru, that's South America, you know, those are the countries that have a likely chance to change their, their agricultural production and get out, so that gets at some of the answer that we're looking at. There were some more hands going up, and I know we're out of time. So. Yeah. I have to hold one more question, last question. Thank you. Uh, I've been seeing many studies coming out recently on this concept of water grabbing, and in general, this idea of certain countries exploiting resources in others. You said water grabbing? Water grabbing, mm -hmm. yeah. And so this idea that certain countries are exploiting resources in other countries, and that would seem to add a degree of interdependency in the system. And thus, I was trying to reconcile that with this idea of countries being self-organized and independent, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. Of the idea that they're not independent because right, it would seem to add a degree of interdependency because resources are being used by others, right? So I was trying to reconcile that with the assumption of the countries being independent and self-organized. Yeah, independently thinking, not it's not that they're independent, right? Yeah, they've they're independent. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. They're independently thinking, but their circumstances for making their decisions are very different. I mean, one country might be in a partnership for their water supplies where their adjacent country to the south has all the water they need. And so that would certainly help determine the trajectory of some of their agriculture. And, and again, that would go into some of the case-based studies that we'd be able to sort of articulate and, and get into. But I don't have anything more to add other than that. Yeah. I, I'm here to stay. We have to wrap it up so people can officially leave. But I'd be glad to continue to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much, John. Let's give him a round of applause for a nice talk. <laughs> Let me say this one thing. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're all here. But in my opinion, being a thermodynamicist and an energy guy for my career, food energy is, is, is the ultimate energy, right? So just kind of leave, that, leave with that thought. I mean, we, can, we talk about nuclear. We talk about fossil fuels. And, but at the end of the day, you know, our food energy is our relationship with the planet. And, and if, as long as that's maintained, we're good. If it's not, I mean, that's, that's the primary sustainability metric that's out there. There is no other one that surpasses calories produced, right? So, all right, thanks. Thank you. What's that?